In Acts the 17th chapter, we read where Paul went to Athens. And they were worshiping many idols. They worshiped many gods. To cover their bases because they looked upon God as being sometimes adversarial. They wanted to appease the gods. They had one to an altar to an unknown God. And I think it's interesting that we think about pagan idolatry. I remember going into Europe and into various places. They still had pagan temples. You could see their idols. But there were very few pagans along that line. And Paul warns us to always, in Colossians 3 and verse 5, to keep ourselves from idolatry, which he says is covetousness. So anything that gets in the way between us and God is idolatry. So sometimes that desire of covetousness is really idolatry. But the thing that impresses me is that Paul, from that background, begins to set forth to all those people who said, what does this babbler say? He's just a seed picker. He just kind of bringing rags. It's not really, what does he say in this new stuff about Jesus? Even in that context, he says, I make known unto you who the true God is. And so it's interesting that he's going to let them know who God is, but he is traveling to an area where they have different views. Now, what's interesting about our life and our time is that the various religions that are in the world today, and I just mentioned some, Judaism, Islam, our, the, the Muslim faith, the Hindu faith, the word denotes from the Indus River people of that area. So 86% the people in India, uh, last time I counted there, they were Hindu, and also Buddhism. And we think, well, that, that, those are religions from uh, across the seas. 86% of our people today in, in America are Christians. And so we want to send missionaries. And we'll go over there, and they will encounter those religions. That day has ended. Because these religions are here. They're here in America. They're here in our community. There are people from these backgrounds that we are encountering in our daily lives. And so we think that they're here in our country. We say, well, they need to know about Christianity. And how we encounter them is the fact I am a Christian. They may be Muslim. They may be Jewish. But I am a Christian. How are we going to relate? What, what can I do to bridge this gap of teaching what is the true God? What is the right path? With all these different religions teaching different things. This morning, I would like to see where could we begin in our discussion with people, and we're going to emphasize Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Jesus Christ because that's why I'm a Christian. Christ, Christian, Houstonian, we belong to Houston. Christian, we belong to Christ. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, we see in the New Testament. So that designate, we belong to Christ. So, so where could we begin in these different religions as we emphasize Jesus Christ to help someone know something about Christianity that will help us in coming to decision, which way am I going to go? Different gods, different religions. And here I am as a person, and I want to be honest, I want to find my way. We need to understand these things, but we need to understand Jesus Christ if we're going to come his way. So let's look at that to our Jewish friends. What would be a great beginning place with them? I would take their scriptures. They look at the Old Testament scriptures as being from God. They talk about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. They understand the prophets. 
And there was a prophecy in Isaiah 53 that was written some 700 years before Jesus ever came to this earth. Before the Word became flesh. 700 years. Now you think about the power of writing something down. Isaiah wasn't just spoken and somebody, oh, I remember him saying this. He wrote down his prophecy 700 years before Christ came. And yet in this one chapter is given such a, a perfect and complete picture of the Jesus Christ that would come. I think that would be a very fruitful beginning to, to, to speak to our Jewish friends. Look at the highlights with me. What interests me at the beginning of this chapter, he's rejected. He despised. He is not esteemed as anything important. And that's how the chapter opens up. Hide your face from him. We esteemed him not. And yet, we'll see in verse 12 that his portion is with the great. And so how would you begin a prophecy of somebody great? Would you say, let's start how, how bad he is? How rejected, how, how rejected he was? People rejected him? You probably wouldn't start that way, but that's the way God starts as he speaks about this servant that was to come upon the scene down the road. He was great, but he was rejected. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verse 21, we see that Jesus very early in his ministry is preparing his disciples of his rejection among the Jews. And even Peter doesn't believe this. That would happen. But Jesus says, I will go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and the third day be raised up. He's taking the whole picture. I'm going to be rejected. And he would be among his own people. Here the Messiah comes and they reject him. They esteemed him not. That's exactly the way Isaiah 53 opens its first three verses. Before summing up that his portion is with the great in verse, in verse 12. I just think it's a remarkable way to begin talking about someone's great. But the reality is that's exactly the way it came to be. He was great, but he was rejected. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. And he said, well, what does that mean? Oh, he, by carrying suffering, he suffered on the cross. Let's talk about him before he ever came to the cross. Matthew does. Because in Matthew, the 8th chapter, in verse 17, when Jesus is healing Peter's mother, wife's mother, his mother-in-law of a fever, miraculous works he's doing, we find that in verse 16, when even was come, they brought unto him many possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our diseases. He's not on the cross. Well, that's why all he did went to the cross. I'm talking about details. And Matthew says, when he took on the griefs of people to heal their diseases, cast out demons and so forth, he was fulfilling Isaiah 53 and verse 4, was written 700 years before Jesus came. It shows his compassion upon the suffering of people. Thirdly, he did die for our transgressions. And in Isaiah 53 verses 7 through 9, we began to, to see the nature of this, and even some details about it that I think is instructive. And you'll notice that he's described as a lamb that has led to the slaughter. He was repressed and was afflicted. He opened not his mouth as a lamb that has led to the slaughter. And as sheep before his shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. 
by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He's speaking about someone's going to be taken away, and we know through death. And for his generation, who among, who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? He's talking about his death, of this someone who would come. He would die for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Somebody deserved to die, but he died in their place. And they made their grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Though he, although he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Who was this rejected one? He was one that would open not his mouth and be led to the slaughter. Jesus, when he was captured and when he was brought before the people, he was determined he wouldn't open his mouth until it was to confess that he's the Son of God. He would speak then. But we find that his death was connected with the wicked and with the rich man was his grave. He was crucified between two thieves. And the idea of his death, just put them in where, they, where you put the wicked people. He fulfilled that. But he was placed in a tomb of a rich man, according to Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60. That detail. Joseph Arimathea was a rich man. He had a new tomb. Nobody was ever put in that tomb, so you're not going to find any bones in there. So, whoa, this is Jesus down the road. No, nobody was there. And when there was an empty tomb, there were no bones. Jesus was resurrected. Part of God driving people, look at the evidence. Here is the fact that his tomb, but 700 years, he was crucified between two wicked men. And his grave was with a rich man's tomb, a rich man's grave. Details. Miracle worker. Died for our sins. But he was also raised. In verse 10 and 11, Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt made it, made, when thou have made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by the knowledge of himself. Shall, many, shall my righteous servant justify many, and thou shalt bear their iniquities. He will justify many. And through the knowledge of the gospel that would take place, through his death and his resurrection, he would justify many. Paul says in Romans 4, in verse 25, delivered up for our transgressions, raised for our justification. Look at the complete picture of this one Jesus. I haven't even begun that when Herod wanted to find out where this Jesus was going or the Messiah was to be born, Micah 5 2 says it's Bethlehem. Jesus wasn't born in Nazareth, he wasn't born in Jerusalem, he was born in Bethlehem. Take your scriptures. And dear Jewish friends, your scriptures prophesy of one that was to come and Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. Can we have a conversation about him? Fulfilled prophecy is powerful. You write something down today and let's see in 50 years if you're right. You write things of details like this and see if a hundred years you'll be right. Seven hundred years? Grave with the rich man? Same one is connected with the wicked? That's pretty powerful stuff. God writes books like that, not man. Well, what about our Muslim friends? I think it, a discussion needs to be with our Muslim friends, a lot of different things. But when they hear Son of God, they see God having sex with Mary. Because that's how you get children. They're thinking in terms like that. My only begotten Son, which the New Testament describes Jesus Christ. God doesn't have children. 
there's a, the divisive the place. God doesn't have, have children. You know, there's no sons of God, son of God, because they're thinking of the sexual relationship that has to take place for that to take place to occur. Begotten means you have sex and have children. And they look at it that way. We need to have that discussion. It has nothing to do with sex when Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. It's not speaking about Bethlehem, ladies and gentlemen. And I think sometimes we, the only begotten son, he born Bethlehem. He was his son from eternity. Now listen to when only begotten takes place. In the beginning was the word. So whenever the beginning occurs, and we have in our Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So when things were beginning, as far as we're concerned, the heavens and the earth, something already was. In the beginning, the word was. It already had occurred. And that word was with God. And the word was God. There was communion, distinctive beings, one God, but idea, because it is, they are God, the word was God, but it's also with God. Communion, fellowship. And that communion fellowship was the love that he describes himself as sonship, love of a father and a son. He didn't have a beginning as a son. It's be eternal. He says in John 17, 5, when Jesus says, I want to have the glory that I had with you before the world was. Glory I had with you? The father-son relationship is eternal. And it's expressed in the only begotten. We're all sons of God, but we're not the only begotten son. That was very unique. And the glory of God was so great that what emanates from his bosom that we can understand is sonship. And when he sex, it was that here was what emanate from his glory, that we can know love and the love of a father and a son. That's how God wants us to know him. So it's eternal sonship. Maybe we can have another discussion. You, you accept him as the Messiah, my Muslim friends. You accept him as a prophet, but he cannot be the son of God. And we need to understand, we're speaking about his eternal relationship with the Father. He became flesh. So man could, be, could behold the glory. Look at John 1 and verse 14. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. There was that relationship. We, we understand, it communicated love and the fellowship, and the glorious fellowship between the Father and the Son. But that's how God expressed himself. And that word, expression of God, comes in the form of the only begotten Son. Not that he had a beginning. He always has been the Son. But now he's come so we can behold such glory of God. And to understand that we've never seen God. But when people looked at Jesus, they saw God. And that's why in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gave him to die. That's connection with what we're trying to teach our Jewish friends of what was fulfilled at the hands of, of Jewish and Roman leaders, fulfilling God's plan that we should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave 
that only thing. He gave the expression of what comes out of the love of his bosom. The word that became flesh was his only begotten son so that we could be saved from our sins. I think that's a kind of a, a barrier that we need to deal with with our Muslim friends. What about our Hindu friends? From India? What is that religion about? And where can we have a beginning conversation with them when we come across them? We need to realize that when we think about God, the Hindu religion says you can't know God. You, there's no way to know God. So we need to get, God can be known. That's going to be a subject matter. Does the Bible teach that? Or does it teach God can't be known? No one has seen God at any time. The scriptures declare that. But can God be known? And the Hindu religion teaches that there are many paths unto God. You could be an atheist and be a Hindu. There are so many paths to, in order to, 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 to get to the end. That, where they're looking at being one with, with God. But the uh, Bible teaches only one way to God. And that's what we see in Jesus Christ. Can God be known? How many ways are there to God? Let's talk to Jesus. Let Jesus answer this for us. John 14. Turn there with me because we read verse 6, but we need to also read verse 7 as well. When Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And in verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one cometh unto the Father but by me. Hindu won't accept that. They will accept he might be one way to come to God, but he's not the way. There are many paths to God. And so that is a discussion that's worth having. And the fact is, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. Well, well can, can God be known? We pick up with verse 7. If ye had known me, ye would have known my Father also. From henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Can God be known? If you know me, you know the Father. That's why we get to verse 9 as he's driving home to Philip. Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you and dost thou not know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou showest the Father? Now those two statements tells us I can know the Father. If you've seen me, Jesus says, you've seen the Father. It tells me there's only one way to the Father. Jesus says, I am that true and that living way. And that is what contradicts the Hindu religion. That's what a Hindu is going to have to grapple with and what a Christian needs to be presenting when we think about Jesus. And a lot of the religions of the world say, oh, Jesus is just one way and you be a Christian and we'll all, we'll all get along. But we're interested in the salvation of people. So we're interested in the truth. And Jesus says, I am the truth. That's how exclusive Jesus says he is. So when we hear people saying, well, uh, you know, Christianity should accommodate all religions. Well, we're going to be nice to people. But Christianity doesn't accommodate all religions. There's one faith. There's one God. There's one true and living way. We need to have that discussion. But God wants himself to be known. And that's not that's totally foreign from Hinduism. You'll never know God. You can't know God. But God wants us to know Him. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 13, Apostle Paul speaks about 
the things that have been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. For who among men knoweth the things of a man, say the spirit of a man? I don't know what's in your mind, except your spirit does. And the only way I can know what's in your mind is that you communicate with me. Now I may know if you're bored or not. I may know if you're sleepy or not. I could tell that, but that's communicated. But to know what you're thinking, you have to communicate it. That's what he's, that's what he's saying here. Say the spirit of man, which is in man. In man. So even so the things of God none knoweth, say the spirit of God. Does he say, well, you can't ever know them? Listen to him. But we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. What Paul wrote down, what we have to read in our New Testaments, in the Bible, comes from the mind of God, who says, I want to be known. I want you to know who Jesus is. He's declared my glory. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. That was written down because he wanted us to know him. And to see the glory of God as Jesus lived among men before he died for our sins. And raised and taken up to glory. And he said, you can know me. And what's written down, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, instead of the wisdom of this world, we have in our Bibles communicate the very word of God. That's why in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, what's written down, is given by inspiration of God. It's inspired of God. It's God-breathed. Why would he breathe out something? Why would he express in words something if he didn't want to be known? That's totally against Hindu religion. But it's something that the Bible speaks about. Speaking about Christ, Apostle Paul, as he was a, a follower of Christ, he was inspired. The things he wrote down were from the mind of God. And he says in Philippians, the third chapter in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming conformed unto his death. He wanted to have that intimate knowledge of the Lord. In Acts 4 and verse 12, Again, Jesus is that only way. There's no other name given under heaven wherein men must be saved. It's only in the name of Jesus Christ and authority that he gives us. So we could talk about many things. The Hindu religion, you say, I, I want to talk about avatar. Avatar. Reincarnation. Let's talk there. But because uh, well, we, got the, we got the incarnation of Jesus. Let's have that talk. That might be very confusing. Because the incarnation is not avatar. Avatar, the Hindu religion, you could duplicate many gods or non-gods. And you thought Avatar was something on your social media, had no background to it? Hindu religion. But that's not the incarnation. That at one time. And he was the only begun. The word did become flesh. And we could see the glory. Jesus was communicating the character, the holy character of God. And the one who never sinned indeed expressed that holiness. But I think this is a place where there's not confusion. But it helps us to start. We're going to have to make a decision about it. And then to our Buddhist friends. When you look at how their religion started. Siddhartha Gautama. He became the enlightened one. He became Buddha. He lived in 563 to 483 BC. As we're looking at the times of destruction of Jerusalem, going into Babylonian captivity and all during that time, leading up to intertestamental period, is when Zaharta lived. Very rich. Father protected him. But when he went out and saw the people that his kingdom was over, he saw suffering. 
And he saw things that troubled him deeply. At the age of 29, he left his wife and his son to go find out about what life is all about. What's the meaning of life? And as he journeyed, he became enlightened. His concept was that human desires are the problem. We desire things that can never fulfill us because they're temporary. What he saw in life was exactly true. It was accurate. Things are temporary when we see things in life. These are riches, they're temporary. You desire your health, you'll get old, and you'll die. And sometimes ill health comes upon people when they're young. And the idea of putting your desires for those things indeed was the problem with life. If you get rid of the desire, that will be the goal of your life. And the goal is nirvana. Now that's not a rock group. That's the quenching of all desires. That's the goal of Buddhism. The quenching of all desires of temporary things till they are blown out. Literally, that's what the word nirvana means. The candle is blown out. You become Nothing as far as feelings, desires. You've meshed into what you should be, and that's how you escape all of the evil and suffering, especially the suffering. Of course, the Bible speaks about the sufferings of Job, and God didn't keep that from him. But I think the discussion could begin about human desires. Is that, is that what is evil? that needs to be quenched and to be blown out our desires? Is that the problem? Christianity has another message about that. And Jesus tells us that. We are not to be detached from our treasures. Oh yeah, but there was a man, he said, I want to have <laughs> eternal life. Look at me, Mark, the 10th chapter. Jesus talked to him, I want to, I want to have e eternal life. <coughs> how, can I, how can I have that? How can I in, 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 uh, achieve that? And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said, One thing thou lackest. He knew the law. I don't know, father and mother. He's keeping all that. But Jesus said, One thing thou lackest. Lack lackest. Go sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor. Yeah, there's your money. That's what you're desiring, money. Get rid of all of that. You say, well, uh, or a Buddhist, I say, well, that's pretty close to what my guy found out. But that doesn't stop there. And he says, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. You're not detached from your treasure. You're being detached from a certain kind of treasure. But your emotions are still connected with it. How do I know that? Because Jesus says in Matthew, the sixth chapter, lay up for yourselves treasures not upon earth. That's what Saharta would look at. He had them. And he would look at it and realize that that's not going to give you happiness. It causes a lot of sorrow. And Jesus says, lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For neither moth nor rust consume where thieves do not break through and steal. For where thy treasure is, thy heart is also. You're not detached from your treasure, are you? That's where my heart is. That's where my desires are. And the conversation could begin, oh, it's not desires are evil. It's that I have the desire for the wrong things. I need to lay up treasures in heaven. They cannot be stolen from me. 
And they're not going to be achieved by covetousness that keeps me from doing good deeds and sharing with the poor. By doing that, I'm laying up treasures in heaven. It's a different type of treasure. And that's where my heart will be also. You're not detached. Desires are not detached from your treasure. That's where your heart is. Not that your heart has become nothing of desire. Matthew 13, 44, Jesus in his parable was speaking about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, the rule from heaven, I want to know what that's like. It's like under a treasure hidden in, the, in the, in, hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And in his joy, there's your desire, there's emotion. His joy, he goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth the field. Why? Because that's where his heart is. I want that treasure. It's of great value. And with joy, it will move me to get that treasure. Emotions are not stopping. Joy is not stopping. Said Harto, was he doing evil because he, would, he had a, a, a desire to be an enlightened one? No. Our hearts need to be enlightened. And what Jesus is saying is that the problem, if he's got your joy and your desires upon the wrong type of treasure. And we need to understand that. The goal is not to become nothing, no thing. And that's what Buddhism becomes. I've lost all sense of self. I messed with nature, what have you. Different ideas about it. It's not treasuring no thing, but it's treasuring the right thing. And Jesus says to the suffering, who are suffering for the cause of Christ, rejoice, there's an emotion, be exceeding glad. There's emotion. For great. There's an estimation. Is your reward in heaven. That's where your heart should be. That's where your joy is. And it's not taking away our desires and our joys. Or our feelings. It's not sweet annihilation. It's coming to delight in God so much that you keep heaping up treasures in heaven that are lasting. And you're having your desire and your focus and your desires not to be cut off. And as I get closer to the goal of what the enlightened one told me, what Buddha told me, is that I become more and more, less and less of myself until I am nothing, nirvana, quitched, blown out. No, I've grown and grown and grown and more and more joy to the treasures of heaven and being with God forevermore. You don't lose your personality with Jesus. Buddha had it right. When he says that your desires for these temporary things causes a lot of trouble. Oh, it does. He experienced that. But see, from the Hindu tradition, you can't ever know God. And there are different paths to God. And the best you can do is to be meshed one with God and nothing about yourself any longer. We'll continue to have fellowship with God as individuals in our glorified state. That's the hope of heaven. And that's a, quite a distinction from Buddhism. This morning... Where shall we begin? You can begin where you want to at different things, but I'll just suggest to a Christian because these people are here and we love people. We love people of different religions. I go, I found a lot of uh, people from, that are Hindu and they're Muslims, even in our neighborhood. And they're good people. They don't assume any other way but they have a different background. Where could I begin talking about Jesus? That's why this lesson has been presented. Talk to our Jews about the fulfilled prophecy. We could teach our Muslim friends the only begotten son doesn't mean he had sex with Mary and that the father does have a son and he's the son of God. 
God can be known to our Hindu friends. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ, who made himself known. And killing desire is not the path. It's rejoicing in the right treasure. And that's the conversation we can have a lot of times with our Buddhist friends, knowing their background and knowing there are some elements of truth in things. But Christianity is that unique. There's one Lord, one faith, there's one God. And we need to have our knowledge in the scriptures that we can say, let's start having this conversation because we don't have to go in missionary work and across the country. We just kind of pay attention to our friends and we'll find us be involved with these different religions. I hope it, it helps you. This morning, those of you who are outside of Christ, we're singing an invitation song, I've decided to follow Jesus. That may be too uh, premature for you. But I'm speaking to some who know the claims of Jesus, who know why Jesus came to this earth, know the miracles that confirmed who he was, realize that he is deed speaks the truth, and you realize I'm in, your, I'm in my sins. And Isaiah 53 speaks to me. I know he's the one that took away my sins, and he's raised for my justification. All you need is an opportunity to make a decision, and this song's for you. I've decided to follow Jesus. And as you think about these verses, those verses will mean you'll bear your own cross. You'll have to be involved in, in doing that. You may have to follow Jesus alone. But when you make the decision that he is the way and he is that only way to the Father, and the glories of heaven are waiting you, and you realize he's the way, you will do that. And I hope you'll obey the gospel this morning as we stand and as we sing.